Okay, friends, good day. Uh, another daily devotional. Today we begin the book of Daniel, the last of what in the uh, Christian canon uh, is among the prophets. In the Hebrew canon, it's among the writings. Um, so uh, it, it, Daniel's an interesting book. So we're going to have uh, we're going to have a good time with it over the next uh, four days. We'll be through Daniel. All right. Um, so let me begin with uh, the Wesley Study Bible introduction to Daniel. Daniel is about 60% stories and 40% vision reports. The stories, chapters one through six, show God's people living in a foreign world where they rise high in the government and exercise great influence. In doing so, their faith brings certain risks, but they maintain faithfulness to God and to the divine teaching. They are deeply needed, living and working in a culture that has not received the divine revelation that came to Israel. In that unbelieving world, God's people take their place, bear their witness, and make their difference. The vision reports, chapter 7 through 12, using apocalyptic symbolism, name in sequence, four empires of ancient history, Babylon, Media, Persia, and Greece. And they refer to a king or kings of each. They show God's people living at home, but under an arrogant oppressor who arises during the fourth empire and wishes to force their conformity to alien ways. The visions show the creator's sovereignty over the nations of the world and promise the end of this persecution. God's people are still passing through these two sets of circumstances in receiving Daniel as scripture. We look to it for guidance appropriate to our circumstances, whether openness or persecution. The last chapter, 12, shows that at some point in God's plan, the end of persecution will also be the end of days, bringing the new heavens and the new earth. Historically, the four empires of the book correspond to four and a half centuries of biblical history, from the heyday of the Neo-Babylonian Empire to the 160s BC, when the arrogant oppressor sought to suppress the Jewish religion in Palestine. This was Antiochus IV Epiphanes, but he is never named in Daniel because he had already become a figure of every human ruler who seeks to subvert and destroy God's people. All right, Daniel, so as I said, is divided, as the introduction said, is divided into two main sections. Uh, the first uh, six chapters are the tales, the stories of the court of Daniel uh, and his friends in the court. And then seven through 12, the literature shifts to these apocalyptic visions and dreams um, that are purported to be uh, Daniel's future vis visions for the future, but in reality are written down after uh, these empires uh, had come on the scene. So so it's uh, prophecy uh, written down and fulfilled after the fact. All right, so as we get into chapter one and begin the story of uh, uh, the tales of the court, uh, you have the story of Daniel and his three companions stands at the beginning of the book and introduces not only the cycle of court legends in Daniel, which is in chapters one through six, but the book as a whole. It may well have been composed specifically for that purpose. Chapter one introduces the book's uh, uh, setting, its main characters, and the central theme of the court stories. The uh, youth, the young Jewish people, have to negotiate how to preserve their Jewish identity while co cooperating closely with, and indeed working for, the foreign monarchs at whose court they serve. The first verses of the book connect the narrative of Daniel with the description of King Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BC, uh, as found in other books of the Bible that, of course, we have already read, 2 Kings and Jeremiah. By telling the story of Daniel and his three friends, the biblical narrator gives the exiles a face and picks up the story where the uh, historian in 2 Kings leaves off. In a sense, the transition from 2 Kings to Daniel um, is sort of uh, emblematic, if you will, of, of the transition from Second Kings to Daniel, or, or the transition uh, is, it's, try this again, it is emblematic of the history of Judaism in general. For Daniel and his three companions, the temporary exile 
imposed by the Babylonian king has turned into a permanent Jewish diaspora or dispersion. And the diaspora refers to Jews scattered throughout different places in the world other than uh, the land of Israel. Um, the date in verse one is somewhat of a puzzle. In the third year of Jehoiakim, it says, this is the year 606 BC. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem in 597 BC. So uh, you've got some discrepancy of dates here. Um, and sometimes these discrepancies are not uncommon as we read in, in other Jewish stories. Um, so it could be just uh, um, the inaccuracy of, of not knowing uh, of exactly when these dates are uh, and if you will, kind of taking an educated guess. Um, the four youth that we read about receive a three-year training in the literature and language of the Chaldeans, which is Akkadian. Uh, the term Chaldean either refers to the Babylonian courtiers as a professional group, or it is used as an ethnic designation for Babylonians. As is customary in such situations, the youth receive new names, which unlike the royal food rations they are given, they receive without any objections, presumably because they are able to keep their Hebrew names. Life in the diaspora meant that dietary restrictions played an especially important role. The concern for proper food clearly overrides any concern Daniel has about the Babylonian education and his Gentile name. The narrator emphasizes that the youth's health is God's doing and not the result of their diet. The story ends as it began with chronological um, attention. The first year of King Cyrus in verse 21 is 538 BC. Daniel 10, one date, then Daniel's final apocalyptic vision recorded in chapters 10 through 12 to the third year of King Cyrus of Persia. Uh, and when we read 121, we hear, have here the anticipation that Daniel uh, will outlast Nebuchadnezzar and serve monarchs from subsequent empires. So beginning in chapter two, we have Nebuchadnezzar's dream. This is the first dream and it introduces a recurring theme in the, in, the, in the stories of the court here, the contrast between the Babylonian courtiers and Daniel. In this case, however, the Babylonian sages never threaten Daniel, but instead benefit from him. It is only because of Daniel's unique ability, both to tell the content of Nebuchadnezzar's dream and to interpret it that they are pardoned and are given their lives. Since Daniel was trained for three years at Nebuchadnezzar's court before he was brought before the king, he can hardly have interpreted the dream in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. It could be that Daniel is interpreting the dream while still in training, though it is more likely that the author of our story didn't know chapter one. Perhaps chapter one was added later as an introduction to the collection of court tales as a whole. So you can pick and choose which, which one it is. There are numerous reports in the ancient Near East about the interpretation of royal dreams. For example, we look at Genesis chapters 40 and 41, though no court chair is ever asked to recount the dream itself first. The impossibility of the task uh, sets the stage for Daniel to shine, and more importantly, for the biblical narrator to make the point that the situation is resolved because of the God of Israel, not because of Daniel's gifts. It's interesting that the chapter here begins in the Hebrew language and switches abruptly to Aramaic in the middle of verse four. And Daniel will see this throughout. It'll be, there'll be some past portions will be in Hebrew. Some will be in uh, the sister language of Hebrew, Aramaic. Um, Nebuchadnezzar's dream is a mystery which only becomes intelligible when Daniel receives a vision in, of the night. The Aramaic word here uh, for the dreams interpretation is Peshar, uh, and uh, the word Peshar uh, in the library of Qumran is used for a special kind of biblical interpretation that comes to be known as Peshar. Daniel responds with a prayer, a hymn of praise to the God of Israel who possesses the qualities Nebuchadnezzar was initially seeking in his court years. He reveals hidden things and knows what is in the darkness. 
brought before the king. Daniel agrees with the court chairs that Nebuchadnezzar's demands are unreasonable, but then adds that it is his God alone who reveals mysteries. The enormous statue of the dream is made of different metals of declining value, which represent four kingdoms in order, Babylonia, Media, Persia, and Greece. Uh, the Prince of Greece in 20, uh, 1020 brings the four kingdom uh, scheme to its, uh, its closing. The, the feet of iron and clay represent the Greek empire divided into Ptolemaic and Seleucid kingdoms. The four kingdoms recur in chapter seven, though there the emphasis is on the succession of the kingdoms. They're also increasing in their use of violence rather than decrease in value. So uh, after, the, after the death of Alexander the Great and the fall of, of, uh, of the Greek empire, um, you have uh, uh, Alexander's generals dividing his, his empire into four, into four uh, uh, smaller kingdoms. Um, Nebuchadnezzar's uh, response uh, to the dream, which is rather uh, euphoric, seems awkward, uh, partly because Daniel has just predicted the demise of the Babylonian kingdom. Uh, also, the Gentile mo monarch and tyrant now worships Daniel and even brings him offerings. Uh, Jewish and Christian interpretator interpretations throughout history were at pains to explain Daniel's rather friendly and close rapport with Israel's arch enemy. The episode here demonstrates Nebuchadnezzar's acceptance of an implied conversion to the God of Daniel, who is the God of gods. Beginning in chapter three, uh, we get the story, the famous story of the fiery furnace. So the motif here uh, of the conflict between the courtiers and Daniel's companions introduced in the previous chapter is now propelled to great drama. The story is filled with uh, very large uh, kind of exaggerated descriptive language um, and, and it's really used uh, for as, as uh, satire. The statue's proportions are gigantic. The list of court officials is unnecessarily repeated verbatim. The list of instruments appears multiple times. The furnace is heated up seven times so the, that the executioners themselves die in its flame. The, ta the tale from a Jewish perspective is in some ways hilarious uh, and deeply revealing. It sharply contrasts Jewish monotheism with Babylonian idol worship a popular theme in literature after the exile. Um, and the king's ridicule, idolatry is ridiculed here with much irony. Daniel is conspicuous for his absence from the tale. Uh, some have suggested that originally the story circulated independently and was only later added into the stories because of Daniel's absence, but we really can't know that. The story could also be a kind of interlude in the book of Daniel. King Nebuchadnezzar erects a golden statue. Uh, the Greek historian, interestingly, the Greek historian Herodotus report, reported a massive statue of solid gold in the temple in the center of Babylon. Uh, dedication ceremonies are well attested in the ancient world, but the religious intolerance at the center of our tale is not. The accusation and interrogation of the three youth by the Gentile tyrant seems fabricated and provides the narrator with this opportunity to have the three men bear witness to their God. Nebuchadnezzar's exclamation, who is the God, nicely captures his own presumptuousness about himself uh, and about what he believes about himself. The response of the youth is, if our God is able to deliver us, implies that perhaps they harbor some doubt whether their God is willing or even able to save them. Uh, but probably what they could have in mind here is that if God chooses to deliver them, that whether in life or in death, they belong to God, that whether they are saved or they are not, they will be faithful to God. Um, Nebuchadnezzar comes across uh, as something of uh, a buffoon uh, in this chapter. He has extreme emotional responses. He shifts from, from rage to devotion. Uh, and you have the religious intolerance here toward these young Jews. 
is replaced by another form of religious intolerance in the final decree. Similarly, the transition from the king's fury in verse 19 to his astonishment in verse 24 to see four men walking in the fire seems rather abrupt. Um, and so uh, we have then uh, the, uh, the rescuing of the young men from the fiery furnace and for Christians, later speculation is that the fourth individual in the furnace must be Christ. Uh, so this is sort of a proto-incarnational appearance of the Son, the second member of the Trinity. All right, let's have prayer. Gracious God, thank you for this day. And may we be faithful in this day, whether this is a day filled with blessings, challenges, whatever it may be, may we always be faithful to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends, thanks. See you tomorrow.